What an honor and a privilege. Truly, what an honor and a privilege. Jenny, Rose, Wilkie, Mahogany, <laughs> Megan, right? All the souls who've spoken to me. What a joy and an honor and privilege, Sean Collins. Kind of thank you, just thank you for your vision, for the vessel that you're holding. And so Chantal and I had been in this beautiful dialogue for probably about maybe a year and a half, two years now. Like, how can we make it work? How can we figure it out? The timing, the flow. And one of the things that I so love about this vision of Emerge is that it is about vulnerability. It is about nakedness. It is about truth telling. It's not trying to be about it like it is about it. <laughs> And it was so beautiful for me today to hear you speak because I was like, oh, she's laying it down, she's laying it down. She's like, I was like, I don't need to get up. And she laid it down. <laughs> and then Mahogany got up and I was like, oh, I really don't need to get up. Y'all are laying it down, you know? Um, but I so appreciate every color, every texture, every facet, every movement, every voice, every tone. You know, we need it all. We need it all. And, um, you know, as I was listening deeply into the rhythm and the time and the flow about what I would share with you all today and what I would talk to you all a little bit about today was, was the journey to success. So we have been talking about reclamation. We have been talking about the soul voice. We have been talking about honoring and knowing your worth. We have been talking about facing your fear, right? We've been talking about seeing God, honoring God, knowing God, right? And the question or the opportunity for us is, as women is that when we remember the truth of who we really are, what will success look like? What will success look like? Now we've been sold a lot of things about success have you not, right? So, you know, I'm with Chantal in my corporate years. Are you kidding me? It's like, go get it. And I was young and black and female in the chemical industry in the 80s, the late 80s. I'm dating myself, y'all, you know, you do the math, whatever, so I But, you feel what I'm saying? Like, triple, 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 like, ism on top of ism on top of ism? Right? But I'm still like, go get it because, you know, my parents born in the 1920s. My parents survived over two decades of Jim Crow segregation in this country. My parents, for my parents, you understand what I'm saying? I'm the first one in my family to walk into a glass building. Right? A Fortune 50 corporation. You could tell me, shit. Are you kidding? Right? But there was a way that the environment hardened me. And I got tired and exhausted from all that proving. Anybody hear what I'm saying? Yeah. All that proving, right? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine full-time jobs, proving. And there was a point for me where I, you know, I was so, I've always been an activist at heart because of my parents. You know, they marched with King, they worked with Malcolm. I had the privilege of growing up in that, you know, and, and of really understanding the implications of that because of who my parents were. So always an activist. But there was a point where what was going on in our society was so pressing for me. You know, I was doing the corporate thing by day, and I was working with young women in gangs in the evenings, South Central Los Angeles, doing gang intervention work in the evenings. And there was a way in which the problems seemed so insurmountable, so insurmountable, that I was like, I cannot in good conscience continue to play here when I know this is where I'm really needed. Anybody hear what I'm saying? when I know this is really what I mean. But the problem was, I 
estão meio... call it the, the, the golden handcuffs, right? And they move the crowd. You want to know, we get a lot of corporate refugees. <laughs> you know, they try to bridge. They're trying to bridge, you know. Like that check is hard to let go. They're trying to bridge. And we try to help them bridge. Um, so that was me. But, but there was something in spirit that kept nudging me. This is where you're supposed to be. And in 1993, I took something called the form. I don't know, anybody remember the form? Anybody wear the form? It used to be called S. And I was wearing like they would just scream at you until you broke down into pieces. And, you know, and, and be clean because you finally really did love your mother underneath it all. You know what I'm saying? But, but the technology was fierce, right? There were aspects of the technology that were really, really fierce. So in 19, we were on in the near, well, whatever. 1993, I took the form. And all weekend, you know, they work on sleep deprivation. They just work on, like, all your shit hanging out. And I remember <laughs> right after that going into the advanced course, and it was during the weekend that there was this huge earthquake in California. I remember Martin Luther King Day. It was huge. I think it was like a 6.8 or something. I was in that. I was living in L.A. And I woke up and I thought we were being bombed. I was like, what, who did, whatever president at the time, who did they piss off? Because America's getting it and found out that it was an earthquake I'm from New York. Never been in an earthquake. It's crazy. I can't count the number of times I said, oh shit, but I, a lot. So in any event, I go into that weekend and I'm in the advanced course. And literally, the building is rocking. And as the building is rocking, my reality is crumbling and unraveling and all of the sort of corporate armor, y'all hear what I'm saying? And all of the sort of the pretense, right? And the presupposition and the facade was cracking, right? And I, at the end of these courses, you declare yourself as something. And I declared myself as the upliftment and empowerment of community using hip hop. <laughs> and I said to myself, what? <laughs> Artists are crazy. Ra, you know a bunch. Artists are also broke, Ra, and we don't do broke. And I'm telling you all, over the course of that weekend, as it revealed itself to me, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I said, okay, God, if I take this step, God, if I do this work, God, if I go into community and I, you know, and I use the art and you'll show me that, just promise me we won't starve. Right? This <laughs> we won't stop. And I slowly but surely made the transition. And God made good on his word, on her word. But then somewhere along the way, in the indoctrination of the culture of activism, I forgot. I forgot the truth call, my world is abundant. I forgot the truth call I am taken care of. I forgot the truth called I am love. And I became broke and scared and angry. Anybody hear what I'm saying? <laughs> and as much as we want to paint the activism world as a panacea, I know not y'all, but some people like to paint the activism world as a panacea, I ironically found myself dealing with the same issues of isms within the context of the activist movement. And I had real tough interactions with white women in the movement. We don't talk about this, you all. We don't talk about this, right? And there's lots we could talk about, but we don't talk about this. But there was a point in the context of my activism world where I found I was able to find my purpose. I was able to use my art in the way that I wanted to, that empowered community, that enabled people to address pressing social issues. And so, you know, through the journey of my activism, I was able to touch it. What I felt was the truth of who I was. And I was able to embrace that. But the challenging part was it did not pay the rent. 
And about eight or nine years ago, I had a come to Jesus moment. And I said that if I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to do this work, I better figure out the money. You hear what I'm saying? I better figure out, I better figure out the money. I owe it to myself and anyone else I'm claiming to serve to figure it out. So I went and got a business education, but I didn't go to Harvard or Yale or Wharton or any of those phenomenal institutions. But I did sit at the feet of some very smart people and who had built multi-million dollar ventures from dust and I cleaned everything I possibly could. And it was phenomenal because it was the first time that I was actually in an environment where I could deal with my relationship with money and me having money, <coughs> wanting money, and, and my loyalty to community. Anybody hear what I'm saying? <laughs> and it was phenomenal to be able to be in an environment, because we weren't having this conversation in an activist environment, hello? We were not having this conversation in an artist environment, hello? And we were not having this conversation in a spiritual environment. You know, and much to my chagrin, I looked up and realized that I had signed on for the poverty trifecta. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, something's wrong with this picture, me. And so through that process, you know, I was able to create space and give myself space without the judgment to look at what is my truth around money. I want you all to close your eyes for a minute and ask yourself that question. Deep breath. I feel y'all. Room to breathe. I feel the room breathing with this one. I feel the room breathing with this one. What is my truth around money? So what was phenomenal was that I could begin to ask myself that question for the first time in an authentic way. But what was challenging about these environments was that there was a problem. They weren't talking to me. They weren't talking to me and they weren't talking to me. They weren't talking to me as someone who wanted to have my mission and my vision for a more just, harmonious, and sustainable world live at the middle of my venture, what I was building, right? So when people in these trainings used to stand up and talk about wanting to help children, literally the trainers would come over like little dogs and pat them on the head, oh, aren't you phenomenally altruistic? Well, let me tell you how to make money. Feel what I'm saying? Right? Not talking to me. They were not talking to me as a young woman of color whose starting point looked very different than a lot of the trainers who were gracing the stage. Please get, don't get me wrong, no disrespect, but it was the parade of the smart white boys. Information was fierce. I would forever be grateful. And it was the parade of the smart white boys. We're not talking to me as a creative whose products and markets did not fit in those neatly prescribed boxes. And so what it called for and what it required was for me to do a serious amount of extrapolation in order to have the information that I was receiving be relevant. But I'll tell you what, when I did it and I applied it, it worked. And I was able to triple my income in something like eight months. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then I remembered my parents who taught my siblings and I that there was nothing more important than family, community, and education. And if you ever get anything, you have a responsibility to share. We knew we were lucky. We knew we were privileged. Y'all feel what I'm saying? My parents saw people hang from trees. My grandfather was murdered when my mother was 12 years old. Y'all hear what I'm saying? In a hunting accident. If we ever got any advantage, it was our responsibility to get back. And to move the crowd. We are an entrepreneurial training company and a global million movement of a million entrepreneurs committed to healing and transforming the culture of capitalism in honor of a just and sustainable economy that works for us. 
So I love the way Judy talked about the different sort of ages that we've gone through, right, and that we're in a purpose economy. I call it an economy of transformation. And it is about how we come into the truth of our highest selves. And it is about how we redefine success on our own terms. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And it is about how we make our own brand of contribution in the world. So we are moving out of the age of celebrity and into the age of the citizen. Amen. And it is about what each and every single one of us is being called to bring into the world. And here's the thing, you all. If you don't bring it, we won't get it. Fuck what you heard. <laughs> it ain't a branding gimmick. It ain't about a crowded market. Y'all hear what I'm saying? We got work to do, ladies. We got work to do. And so your contribution, you know, the one that's calling, yeah, that is time. It's time. Somebody else said that to y'all tonight. Who said that to y'all tonight? Right? Somebody else said this. The amazing woman that took the stage, somebody else told you all it's time tonight. It's time. It's time. So I just want to engage the room and then, I'm, and then I want to take you into an activity because I feel like it's so important to give you something concrete to walk out of here with tonight. So in Move the Crowd, we work with entrepreneurs who are in three stages of development and, and we have sort of names and ways in which we identify and relate to them. So for those of you who have an idea, you're, you're not moving on it yet, but just but something's brewing. We call you the I Have a Dream set. So y'all wave, I have a dream. You and Martin. <laughs> then we have people who are in process of what they're building. These are our established, we call you all our emerging entrepreneurs. These are our established entrepreneurs, right? So you've been working and you're trying to figure it out. Y'all hear me? You're trying to figure it out, you're trying to work it out. And it's really about your business model, right? And so we call you all the show me the money set. <laughs> So wave your hand if you're down with show me money, so show me money. So what we working with, clear, very nice. Like it's a show me the money room. I can feel that when I said, are you on the money room? I can feel y'all with show me money. Okay. And then we have our, what we call our experience or our seasoned entrepreneurs. Like you figured out your business model, you're generating revenue, and it's really about how you scale and grow. And we call you all, I believe I can fly. <laughs> I believe I can fly. Any of my I believe I can fly in the house? Okay, beautiful. So guess what I was going to say? And and you all all should be raising your hand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? Because it's always about what we create and what we hold as the highest intention for ourselves. Do y'all feel me? Is there anybody questioning whether or not you're an entrepreneur or whether or not you're in business? Very good. <laughs> I get on people. Oh, I'm not in business. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so you eat air and live where? <laughs> if you are taking revenue for your services, I don't care who you work for, you're in business, right? And so the opportunity is how do you be in business in a way that is consistent with your values, that is in alignment with your highest talents, gifts, and abilities, and that is making the positive impact and difference that you want to make in the world, amen? Amen. amen. So I want to take you all into an activity. This is the cornerstone of what we're doing in our work with the crowd. And I want to give this to you all because um, it is the lifeblood. It is the lifeblood of our work. So we do something called an L3 in with the crowd. And it's all about this context for how we make our contribution, our highest contribution, right? So I've already named those three things, right? So we believe and with the crowd that your highest contribution is guided by a context that supports, one, your most deeply held values, two, the unique combination of talents and gifts and abilities, and three, the most passionate impulse that guides you towards the opportunities or challenges that you most want to engage in the world. And we call it your L3, and it stands for how you live, how you love, and how you lead. And with the crowd, we have a saying, more powerful than what you say is what you do. And more powerful than what you do is who you be. And your L3 supports you in being able to own and embrace and express the truth of who you really are in service of what it is that you're here to do in the world. Y'all feel me? 
So we're going to take you through a very quick and focused guided meditation. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you get to activate this in your life. So I want to invite you to gently clear your laps. If you have a little something to write with, that's okay. Your journal, you can leave it on your laps because we will be turning to a little bit of writing. But everything else will clear up. Find a comfortable posture, fresh your posture, stretch, yarn, whatever you feel like you need to do to move back into a receptive space. I know it's been a long day today. And so I want to just invite you to begin to pay attention to your breathing. I also want you to feel yourself being supported by the chair. Feel your back against the back of the chair. Feel your butt being supported by the seat of your chair. Feel the wisdom and the strength at the intersection of your spine, right, your first chakra. Continue to just notice your breathing. And then when you're ready, ever so gently, ever so slowly, closing your eyes. So as you think about yourself, fully realized. And as you think about the life you wish to live, what are the values that are most important to you? What are the commitments and convictions that guide how you move in the day to day? Is it joy? Is it love? Is it honor? Is it peace? And how are these values expressed in how you live your life? How you live is all about what you value. What you value and what is most important to you. So I'm going to invite you to gently open your eyes. If you can move towards a piece of paper, beautiful. And I just want you to write for about 30 seconds, right? What do you value? Don't worry, for homework we're going to finish this, but we're going to get started. What do you value? What is really important to you at the beginning, middle, and end of the day? What do you value? If you need something to write with, you have cards like you can share. I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but please use that. Totally can. What do you value?
So you're going to slowly and gently move back towards that piece of paper. And again, we'll take about another 30 seconds and just respond to the question. Why are you here to bring? And I'm really going to invite you not to censor this one. Let it flow. What will you ultimately impact in the world? What will you ultimately impact in the world? So again, moving towards your paper. Take about another 30 We are a community of practice, and we need more places of practical. Our inspiration must be met with structures where we can apply what we are learning and feeling and growing and moving through, yes? So you should hopefully find this card on your seat, if not, the beautiful Dana Balicki. This part of our team is fantastic to you. So, if you go to the blog on our website, you can actually download an L3 <coughs> declaration worksheet. And I want to invite you to do that. The entrepreneurs in our community actually develop a six-line statement that represents how they live, how they love, and how they lead in the world. And the worksheet will take you through the process. It will give you examples. Our gift to you all, Emerging Women, we love you. So. This is the card, go to the website, click on the blog, you'll see the tip of the month, which is all about remembering, and right there is the worksheet, and you can download it. <coughs> 
So, success is about alignment. How you live is your vision. How you love, that is your mission. And how you lead, that is your purpose. And we believe, and I firmly believe, that when you are trued up, everything is possible. Everything is possible. When I was in corporate, it was about the money. When I was an activist, still am, but you know. When I was an activist, starving activist, it was about saving the world, rescuing the people. As a conscious entrepreneur, as a solar entrepreneur, it is about liberation. And liberation for me is about how can I come from love, no matter what is going on around me. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That is the word for me now. How can I come from love? And if I can come from love in the most difficult of situations, then I will have achieved success. So I want to leave you with that question. As you remember and reclaim and step into the fullness and the light and the truth of who you are, how will you define it? How will you define it? And what brand of contribution will you make? Because we need to know. I love you all. Thank you.